Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to this web seminar. So this is the title of my talk. And this talk is based on uh, work in a collaboration with my former students, So Chigusa and my colleague, uh, Kazunori Nakayama. So first introduction. So what I'd like to discuss today is the possibility to use magnoid citation uh, to look for the dark matter signal. So magno is a quantized spin wave. And for example, if you think about the uh, ferromagnetic crystal, so this is the schematic picture of the ground state. So each blob indicates the lattice site on which a bunch of electrons are localized. And at the ground state, the total spin of all the sites are pointing to the same direction like this. But of course, we can also think about some kind of spin wave like this in the bottom figure. And uh, of course, this is a classical description, but uh, we, uh, yeah, we can also quantize the spin wave like this, which will give us magnon. And the point today is that such a kind of magnon excitation may be used for the dark matter detection, in particular when action or hidden photon plays the role of dark matter. So Actually, that kind of idea is not particularly new because several people have already discussed such a kind of uh, possibility. And in particular, recently, uh, Crux collaboration people have proposed some setup uh, to look for the dark matter signal by using the magno excitation. So yeah, this is the kind of schematic picture of their uh, setup. So they proposed to prepare some cavity with some strong magnetic field. And inside the cavity, uh, they propose to set some uh, magnetic material like this. Then with this kind of setup, actually, uh, if action is the dark matter, then action, uh, okay, so then the action oscillation may be converted to magnon inside the magnetic material like this. Then this magnon can be converted to the cavity photon, which can be detected by using some method. So basically, this is a setup of the Crux experiment. And they claim that the yeah, action, action search may be possible with this kind of uh, setup. So motivated by this kind of argument, uh, we started our collaboration to think about the possibility to use this kind of setup for the dark matter search. And uh, today, yeah, I'd like to explain what we have found in our collaboration. So what I'd like to discuss today is something like this. So yeah. I'd like to discuss a dark matter search with magnon, adapting the crux life setup, which I showed in the previous slide. So the first thing I'd like to mention is a kind of quantum mechanical calculation of the event rate. Uh, that is because in the original crux proposal, uh, they use some kind of classical uh, method to estimate the signal uh, quantum mechanical version of it, because in some case, the number of the Magnon excitation becomes pretty small. It may become of order one or smaller, so that quantum mechanical effect may become uh, quite important. And then another thing I'd like to mention is that, uh, okay, originally, Crux people used their setup to look for the action dark matter. And we found that the same setup can be also used for the search of hidden photon dark matter, so that uh, I'll explain that kind of thing too in my talk today. So that's, uh, yeah, that's what I'd like to discuss today. And this is the outline of my talk. So yeah, first I'd like to explain what Magnon is. In particular, I'd like to explain some basic features of Magnon. Then I'd like to explain how the Magnon ex excitation may happen uh, if action or hidden photon plays the role of dark matter here. Then I'll summarize my talk. So that's the plan of my talk today, okay? So, yeah, and before going into the detail of the uh, yeah, main part, maybe I should mention that uh, there really, there really, really exists some material uh, with which uh, we can observe magnon behavior. So as far as I know, the most famous material for the magnon study is YIG, uh, ethereum iron garnet, in, yeah, which has very complicated lattice structure like this. So inside the unit uh, cell of this uh, material, uh, there exist 20 uh, iron ions. 
and some of the spin system, uh, yeah, spin of some uh, ion is pointing upward and the others pointing downward. And there is some net magnetization because of the difference of the number of the upward uh, pointing and downward pointing spins. But actually the detail of the spin structure inside the unit cell is not so important for my discussion because uh, in the following discussion, I just used the so-called Kittel mode. So that is the spin wave uh, in which uh, all the spin uh, inside the unit cell moves coherently. So in such a kind of case, uh, we just concentrate on the total spin of this uh, unit cell so that uh, we don't worry about the detailed structure inside the unit cell. And I just use the ferromagnet uh, spin wave uh, in the Heisenberg model uh, for my study. So anyway, the point is that we can really have some material with which uh, we can excite magnum and uh, yeah. We, yeah, keeping this in mind, uh, I try to explain So yeah, we're going to the main part and let me explain what the magnum is. In particular, uh, let me explain its uh, quantum mechanical treatment. So the starting point of my discussion is the Heisenberg model. So this is the Hamiltonian containing two terms. The first term here is the interaction between the magnetic field and the spin. And the second term here is a spin-spin interaction. And uh, yeah, this S, is the spin operator acting on L side. So this L uh, refers to the side position. And of course we are, uh, yeah. So we want to have quantum mechanical treatment so that this is the operator satisfying the relevant uh, commutation relation. So if you think about the spin operators on the same lattice side, then it's just, uh, yeah, they just satisfy the ordinary commutation relation like this. And if you think about the spin operators on different lattice sites, then they just commute. So that's one thing I should mention. And another thing I should tell you is that the, actually the total spin of each lattice side is fixed. So as I mentioned, in general, there are many electrons on the same lattice side so that the total number of spin, uh, yeah, total spin of such a kind of site may, be, uh, may vary. However, in the following, I assume that the system is put into a very low, cold, uh, low temperature environment so that the electron spin in each uh, lattice site are in the ground state. So in such a kind of case, the eigenvalue of S squared operator, I mean the size of the spin is fixed for each uh, lattice site. So for example, uh, if you operate the S squared operator onto the uh, state, then it just becomes a constant, small s, small s plus one, where this small s is the size of the spin on each lattice site, okay? Then, uh, because we are concentrating on the subspace of the Hilbert space with this kind of constraint, uh, actually, we can rewrite the spin operators by using the uh, creation and annihilation operators of the magnon. So what we do is first introduce some operators, which I call C and C dagger, satisfying this commutation relation. So they really look like the creation and annihilation operators. And to write down the spin operators by using those uh, C and C dagger operators like these. And I skipped the detail of the calculation, but uh, you can really check that uh, these uh, spin operators in terms of these C and C dagger satisfy the relevant uh, commutation relation, assuming this uh, commutation relation. So first of all, uh, yeah, we obtain the ordinary commutation relation for the spin operators. And second thing is that if you calculate the S squared, then it just becomes constant based on these expressions. So yeah. These are the uh, relevant relations to deal with the spin system which we have in mind. And in such a kind of case, uh, the ground state can be just characterized by this kind of relation. So if the annihilation operator is acting on the ground state, it just vanishes, meaning that the spin of the ground states are all pointing to the Z direction based on this kind of relation. Then now, uh, yeah, we work with this kind of expression for the spin operator. So roughly speaking, this C and C dagger are the creation and annihilation operator of magnon in a lattice space. But actually it's more convenient to go to the momentum space. So as usual, uh, we perform the Fourier transform of the operators from the coordinate space to the momentum space like this. 
to define these operators C and C daga, CK and CK daga. Then, uh, yeah, we can just check that the CK and CK daga operators satisfy the commutation relation like this. So they can be identified as the creation and annihilation operator in the momentum space. And if you substitute the expression of the spin operators into the uh, Heisenberg model uh, Hamiltonian, then we can find the free part of the Lagrangian like this. So what we did is to substitute the spin operator these into the original Hamiltonian and expanded the Hamiltonian in terms of CK and CK Daga. Then we obtained the free part of the Hamiltonian like this so that uh, we can really see that, uh, okay, so these are regarded as the creation and, and annihilation operators of some quanta called Magnum. So we can see that first of all, the Hamiltonian is diagonalized in the momentum space. And we can also understand the energy of each quanta from here. Or if we go to a very uh, low energy limit, I mean low momentum limit, where this scale is pretty small, then uh, we can find this partial relation of the magnum like this. So the energy of the magnum contains two contributions from this expression. One is coming from the external magnetic field, uh, that the so-called lama frequency like this. And the second term in, uh, is coming from this spin-spin interaction. And in fact, in the following discussion, uh, I'll concentrate on the case where the De Broglie length of the action, the background action, is much longer than the system size. So that in such a kind of case, actually, the excitation of the higher momentum mode, uh, characterized by this term, is becomes irrelevant. So actually, in the following discussion, actually, this second term is irrelevant, and we just concentrate on the zero mode, k is equal to zero mode, whose energy is just characterized by this uh, lama frequency. And if you calculate this value, then uh, the, lama, uh, the energy corresponding to this lama frequency is about 4.1 milli electron volt for the external magnetic field of, of about one tesla. So in that kind of sense, uh, the action mass around 1 milli elect uh, 0.1 milli electron, uh, 0.1 milli electron volt. That's a kind of target of the action mass uh, relevant for the study with the detector with magnum excitation. So basically, yeah, this, these are the basic features of the magnum, which I will use in the following discussion. And the next, I'd like to explain how the magnums are excited, but uh, is there any question so far? Okay, looks like no. So now let me explain how the magnums can be excited if the oscillating action plays the role of the uh, role of dark matter in the background. So magnons can be excited if the action has a coupling to the electron spin and such a kind of uh, coupling can be obtained if the electron has a Pechequin charge as in the case of the DSS, DS, uh, DFSD uh, action model. So in such a kind of case, the action has a coupling to the Pechequin current which contains the uh, contribution coming from the electron. So this is the most important term for the following discussion, with this psi being the electron spin, uh, uh, spinner for the electron. And this A is, uh, is the action field. And because we think that the action is, the back, uh, is dark matter so that uh, it can be regarded as oscillating background field. So yeah, we parameterize the action field like this. So this A0 is the amplitude and this MA is the action mass characterizing the uh, oscillation frequency of the action field. And because this part, psi bar gamma mu gamma phi psi, this part contains the electron spin operator so that after, integrate, uh, after the volume integration, this part will become the interaction between the action field and the electron spin and the total electron spin can be converted to the total spin and the sum of, the, sum of all the spins inside the magnetic material. So by using that kind of argument, uh, we obtain this kind of interaction Hamiltonian to study the magnum excitation. So in particular, in this part, we have the spin operator for, the, uh, for each uh, lattice site. And if you go to the momentum space using the creation and annihilation operators. Uh, this is the relevant uh, interaction Hamiltonian 
to study the magnetic excitation. So basically, the interaction of Hamiltonian contains linear term in the creation and an creation and annihilation operators for the zero mode of the kit, uh, of the uh, magnon, the so-called Kittel mode. And this V parameterizes the strength of the coupling between the action and uh, magnon state, magnon excitation. And, more and another important thing is that this uh, interaction Hamiltonian is multiplied by this uh, kind of oscillatory function coming from the action oscillation here. And once we obtain this kind of interaction Hamiltonian, uh, then we can calculate the uh, magnetic excitation rate uh, quantum mechanically. So for that kind of purpose, what we should first do is to expand the state uh, by using the uh, eigenstates of the number operators of the magnons. So grand state, or magnon state, and so on, with introducing time-dependent expansion coefficient alphas. Then uh, we can write down the Schrodinger equation uh, for these coefficient. And in general, the Schrodinger equation is infinite dimensional, actually, yeah, like this. But uh, in practice, in the case of our interest, the excitation number of magnon is actually not so large, and usually it is smaller than one, so that uh, we can uh, truncate this equation up to some point. And in particular, if we truncate this equation up to the one magnon state from uh, here, yeah, like this, then we can yeah, easily solve this differential equation to obtain an uh, analytic solution to this kind of equation. And in particular, uh, this is the analytic solution for this coefficient alpha one, uh, from which we can obtain the excitation rate of uh, up to the one magnon state. And one important thing is that if lama frequency becomes close to the action mass, then actually this uh, function alpha one becomes quite enhanced uh, because of this kind of uh, resonant behavior. And in this kind of limit, actually this function alpha one is proportional to the operation time t, like this. Because yeah, numerator and denominator both go to zero in this expression. So naively speaking, uh, we can expect a, large, a very large uh, magnetic excitation rate uh, if we take large enough uh, operation time t, but actually that is not true because the coherence of the system cannot be maintained forever. Uh, I'll come back to that point in the following slide, but uh, for a moment, let me just uh, cut off the time integration up to some point, uh, I mean, uh, uh, some relaxation time to estimate the signal rate by using this expression. Then the Magnon excitation rate or signal rate through the magnon excitation is actually coming from, uh, is uh, yeah, obtained something like this. So it's proportional to the coupling strength squared and it's also proportional to the some relaxation time of the system, how relax. And in estimating the relaxation time, uh, I consider two different time scales. So one is the time scale for the uh, dark matter relaxation, I mean, relaxation time for the dark matter oscillation. So I assume that the dark matter oscillation, I mean, uh, dark matter is, uh, okay, action is a dark matter, so that uh, action oscillation should actually contain uh, various velocity components. So the coherence of the action oscillation can be actually maintained only for a time scale of about one over mv squared. So that's one time scale for which determines the relaxation time of the system. And the another uh, important time scale is the relaxation time of the cavity mode photon and magnon. So the standing wave in the cavity or the magnon excited in the magnetic material cannot live forever, but they dissipate. Uh, and such and the time scale for such a kind of dissipation depends on the experimental setup so that uh, we just follow the relaxation time scale uh, given in the crux proposal, which is about two microseconds. So by comparing these two numbers, uh, we decided to use two microseconds uh, as a total relaxation time to estimate the signal rate through the magnetic excitation. And we obtained this kind of result. So yeah, once we obtain uh, this kind of result, then just by comparing the signal rate with the uh, background noise rate, uh, we estimated the uh, sensitivity uh, for this uh, action electron electron coupling. Uh, yeah. And this is what we obtained. 
So in this plot, uh, I showed the expected sensitivity, uh, kind of optimistic one, as a function of the action mass. So horizontal axis is the action mass, and the vertical axis is the action electron-electron coupling. And in this discussion, I first assumed that the cavity free, I mean, uh, oscillation frequency with a cavity photon is said to be equal to Lama frequency to maximize the conversion rate from magnon to cavity photon for the detection. Then uh, I assume that the cavity frequency and the Lama frequency are scanned uh, in some range to have the access to various action mass. And for each, uh, for each fixed uh, frequency, I assume the observation time of about uh, of 1,000 second and 10,000 second for each frequency. Then, uh, okay, our conclusion that above this line, uh, the signal uh, becomes larger than the uh, square root of the uh, noise rate so that uh, uh, we may be able to observe the signal by using the magnon excitation. And the first thing we can observe is that uh, as the action mass becomes larger, then the sensitivity becomes better like this. And the reason is that uh, in this estimation, we optimistically assume that the background is mainly coming from the thermal excitation of the, uh, of the cavity photon. So as we increase the uh, action mass, uh, it means that we have to uh, excite the cavity photon with larger frequency, meaning that for such a kind of uh, cavity photon, the excitation becomes more difficult because of the because of the Boltzmann suppression factor. So that is the reason why we obtain a better sensitivity for uh, uh, for the <coughs> large action mass region. And uh, for ten years of operation, uh, we found that, for example, uh, we can scan this region of the action mass. Uh, assuming that the center of the scan is somewhere around 200 microelectron volt for the action mass. And of course, we can change the scan region, but if we want to go to small action mass region, then probably we, large, we need a larger cavity to make the uh, cavity frequency to be equal to the action mass for the coherence. I mean, uh, to convert the uh, magnon signal to the uh, cavity photon. And if you want to go to the large action mass region, then we need a stronger magnetic field to increase the Lama frequency. But uh, if we can solve these kinds of te technical difficulties, then a uh, similar setup can be also applied or used to access the action mass with smaller or, yeah, with smaller. Okay, so that's the end of the discussion about the search for the action. And now, uh, let me, let me discuss the case of hidden photon dark matter. So actually, so far we just used the action for the discussion, uh, for calculating the signal rate, but the similar argument can be just applied to the case of the hidden photon dark matter. And let me explain that in the rest of my talk. So the idea, idea is very simple. So this is the starting point of the uh, discussion. So as usual, uh, I introduce uh, the hidden photon field uh, whose field strength is denoted uh, as h mu nu, which has a mass term like this. And this a mu nu is a field strength for the standard model photon field. And I assume that the hidden photon and the standard model photon has a kinetic mixing term parameterized by this epsilon parameter. So yeah, this is the starting point, but usually, or for the following discussion actually, it is more convenient to go to the basis where there is no kinetic mixing. So first we just rearrange the uh, Hamiltonian or kinetic term like this. Uh, just combine uh, these two terms into one. And yeah, and yeah, there is some uh, change here. But uh, anyway, if you go to this basis, then we can easily see that actually the canonically normalized vector fields are given like uh, given by this and this. And first of all, this combination becomes the massless uh, photon field without kinetic mixing with any other fields. I mean, any other uh, hidden photon. And the massive photon, I mean, the massive hidden photon field is just given by this, neglecting this expression squared part. But anyway, uh, in the following, we work in this basis, 
then uh, we can see that actually the standard model, uh, standard model charged fermions have a coupling to the, uh, this hidden photon field in this basis. Because in the original basis, uh, the standard model fermions just have a coupling only to this uh, AMU field, standard model uh, photon field. But if you go to the uh, canonical uh, canonically normalized vector field, field uh, yeah, this basis, then yeah, uh, this AMU is replaced by this combination so that hidden photon now has a coupling to the ordinary electromagnetic current. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let me just continue. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, so this is, yeah, okay. So, yeah, this is the important term to calculate the signal rate. So, as usual, uh, yeah, from this, uh, in the interaction between the electron spin or, yeah, the spin operator and the hidden magnetic field. And actually, once we obtain yeah, this kind of interaction Hamiltonian, then we can just calculate the event rate, as in the case of the action, uh, back, uh, action dark matter. And the calculation is completely the same, so I will not uh, repeat, but uh, I just mentioned that this event rate can be just uh, obtained by replacing 1 over f for the action field by this combination, which is coupling constant uh, in front of this uh, uh, coupling between the hidden photomagnetic field and the spin operator. Then this is the sensitivity we obtain for the case of the hidden photon dark matter case. So again, uh, uh, we may uh, have some access to the hidden photon dark matter in this parameter region. So first of all, uh, yeah, horizontal axis is the hidden photon mass and the vertical axis is the strength of the kinetic mixing parameter epsilon. And this gray region is already excluded by other constraints, mainly coming from the astrophysical argument. But um, what we can see is that uh, the detector with magnum excitation may have some access to the parameter space, which is not exclu excluded yet, yeah, somewhere around here, so that it is quite interesting. And some other people propose other uh, methods to uh, look for the hidden photon dark matter using polar material or direct material, and they have a sensitivity to the mass region of about uh, 0.1 to 0.2 uh, electron volt. And in the magnum case, the relevant region is uh, the relevant mass range is a little bit uh, are more smaller so that uh, it will give us some independent information about uh, uh, hidden photon dark matter. Okay, so that's, that's all and let me summarize my talk. So today uh, I have discussed the action hidden photon dark matter search uh, using uh, magnum excitation. And for that kind of purpose, uh, I also discussed or explained the quantum mechanical calculation of the magnum excitation rate. And I think dark matter searches with magnum is pretty interesting. Uh, one reason is that, yeah, of course, uh, we may have some access to the parameter region which is not excluded yet. And uh, as, as I mentioned, the sensitivity is pretty good, uh, in, in particular for the, dark, uh, for the dark matter mass of around 0.1 milli electron volt. And I skipped the detail, but uh, there may be uh, another possibility to look for the dark uh, action or hidden photon dark matter by using the cavity mode photons. Uh, with combining the information coming from those kind of cavity mode and magnons, uh, we may also have some useful information uh, about the dark matter candidate. So yeah, okay, that's all. Thank you very much. So thank you, it was very clear. So, uh, questions from the audience? Um, so maybe just ask you a, a, a point that I missed. Uh, at some point you uh, dis, uh, discussed the, the, the Hamiltonian for the magnon axon interaction by introducing a two-level system, right? Which one, uh, uh, excuse me? At some point, uh, um, you introduced a, a, a two-level approximation for the Hamiltonian interaction. Ah, 
So yeah, at this just point, a point that I, that I missed. Is this approximation justified by the smallness of the coupling graph? Uh, yeah. So uh, in the case of a calculation, actually, the excitation number is usually less than one. So it, yeah. So we can just terminate the uh, difference. Uh, yeah, shredding equation up to one magnum state. But actually. Uh, we also we can just solve this equation numerically, and we confirm that the result doesn't change so much, even if we include the higher uh, occupation number states. Okay, thanks. That was uh, that was the point. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay, uh, there is a, a raised hand by Eduardo, so um, yes, can you yes. hear me? Just to speak, uh, ask the question. Do you hear me? Thank yes, you. I can. Okay, so I have a, I have a question. So uh, as, far, as far as I know, all these uh, proposals uh, uh, using magnons date back already to the 80s, basically. And, uh, and usually all these, um, all these proposals have just one drawback, which uh, Cox tries to uh, avoid by using uh, relatively small uh, ethereum uh, iron garnets in uh, cavities. And uh, the problem is that uh, um, to have magnons, you need a ferromagnet. But the problem with ferromagnets is that uh, uh, any photon that you produce inside gets screened because it's a ferromagnet, it's not a conductor. So the whole point is that when I see these uh, exclusion, like these projection reaches for, um, for uh, kilograms per year exposure, I wonder what would be uh, the red out of, uh, like how would you do the red out of such an experiment? Like, uh, yeah, like that is a, yeah, that's a very good question. And actually we need uh, some technique to read out the magnum excitation. Uh, and actually, we don't have any particular idea, in particular for one kilogram of the material. But one hope is that uh, there is some discussion or uh, experiment showing the magnetic excitation and read out uh, uh, one magnetic, uh, magnetic excitation by using the magnetic photon mixing in the cavity. So for example, uh, yeah. So because of the mixing time between, I mean, the, because of the coupling between the magnetic field and the spin, uh, actually the cavity photon mode uh, coupled to the magnon. And experimentalists already observed the mixing between magnon and cavity photon. Uh, is, uh, yeah. So this is the experimental setup, though the YIG is very, very small in this experiment. But anyway, uh, first of all, yeah, maybe we, we may be able to use the mixing between the magnum and cavity mode to read out the magnum excitation. That's our hope. Though, no. there, yeah. Okay, no, because, uh, because, uh, because uh, as far as I remember, uh, the idea of using uh, the equivalent magnetic field of a ferromagnet was proposed already by Wuchek et al, like uh, in a paper of the 80s. And, uh, and the reason why they gave up early is, uh, was because of the difficulty of uh, reading anything from a ferromagnet compared to a conductor. And by the way, this is why, for example, recently we had the proposal using uh, metamaterials, which uh, search exactly in your part of the parameter space. And in that case, well, our readout also is complicated because uh, the antenna uh, design is not uh, easy in that case, but at least ours is a conductor, so. Yeah, okay, so yeah, I should admit that uh, there is no, uh, technique yet to read out uh, magnon, uh, in particular for one kilogram, but. Uh, so for your interest, uh, I think that there was recently a paper uh, by uh, Mitridate et al, uh, in which they do something similar with the magnons and uh, uh, I, I think they use phonons, generically collective uh, excitations, and they propose the use also of uh, deposited particles on the detector. So it's a bolometric measurement. But uh, mm -hmm. honestly, I, I think it's uh, it, at a very early stage. Uh, but in principle, you can uh, you can try to look uh, at uh, this uh, this kind of red outs. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, uh, other questions or comments or curiosities? 
So I don't see any, maybe we can just uh, close the session. So I thank you again both the speakers for this very nice uh, seminars and uh, see you next week. Thanks a lot.